everybody, Coach Matt here. How are you? I hope things are well in your neck of the woods. We are uh, coming to you on a cooler, thank goodness, cloudy, thank goodness, and rain is expected this afternoon with some thunderstorms. <laughs> yeah, very, very good. Landscape probability yesterday was very high. Today will probably kind of be a day off uh, as the rain moves in. Hey, this particular episode, I hope that I'm speaking to a homeowner who's just basically given up on actually putting plants in your ground, in the native soil around your house. For one bad soil reason or another, uh, like you, you might want to listen to this a bit. We're going to talk about some solutions, a couple of them, uh, to crappy soil. Horrible soil conditions can, uh, can cause you to spend money on plant material, put it in the ground, do your best efforts, but for one reason or another, they just don't do well. Soil that will not allow normal ornamental plantings to survive and certainly not to thrive. So that's what we're covering. I'm glad you're here. Let's get it started. Hey friends, Maestro here. Please check out the description for this podcast where you will find important links related to this video as well as links to the website, discounts, and much more. Also, don't forget, Yard Coach now offers personalized consultations to help you get your project launched and completed or just answer your specific landscaping questions on a personalized level. See the website at youryardcoach.com for more details. Now back to this week's episode. So do you suffer from one kind or another insufferable soils that very much limit your landscape possibilities? Maybe your house is in a great location, a great neighborhood, close to great schools, close to your work, no commuting, great parks and whatever, but the soil is for crap. It's just garbage, heavy clays, uh, lots of clay and rock and stuff that only seems to grow native trees and native weeds. I certainly have. I have suffered that both well, two times in my house owning career. My first house in Hayward, California was this way for sure. It was basically sandstone city and very little topsoil except in just a few places in my yard. Many places like the backyard was really, really steep. You went out a few feet off the back slider and then boom, up a hill that was uh, kind of terraced out with some steps and then previous owners had uh, carved out a little room enclosure up there. Anyway, basically the soil was almost insufferably implantable. And so I had to take some steps. You know, I had to take some steps to try and get something to work. And I'll share with you what I ended up doing at the ripe old age of 24 years old. Now, 40 some odd years later, Brook and Pond is a very beautiful place. We are very happy with the surroundings here. We're nestled in the forest, peaceful, but lacks good rich soil for ornamental planting. And I want to emphasize that ornamental plantings around the house area. I'm kind of surrounded by a uh, uh, shaley ledge stone. Uh, it's very porous. I mean, it perks out pretty fast, but there's not a lot of organic matter in and around the home area. It was, it was scraped off down to bedrock so that a good solid foundation could be poured and nothing was brought back. It's pushed down and out front, down past the, the useless big lawn that we have. So down there, yeah, I could, I could start planting a few things down there. But then I'm contending with having to drag a hose or put an irrigation system in, whatever other little problematics that come up with something so far away from the, the water source. So there are some alternatives, and I have used them at my first home a little bit, but certainly more importantly here at Brook and Pond nowadays. Now, before all the just go native coach chasers fly out of the woodwork and claim that that is the answer to everything, let's do just a little bit of a reality check. Natives, although there are good ones, natives not 
always are the answer, mainly because in developed neighborhoods, which is not me, I'm not in a developed neighborhood at all, but neighborhoods, for instance, maybe where you're at, natives are uh, genetically DNA programmed to grow, bloom, reproduce, and all it wants to do is proliferate itself from a parent source to wherever it can go and wherever it can grow. And that is not always a good answer in an ornamental residential landscape setting. It doesn't work well. It can take over your area, your immediate area, and then if it goes to seed or you allow it to go to seed, it can spread to your neighbors and your neighbor's neighbors and so on and so forth. Hence the reason dandelions are in the Arctic Circle as well as in the tropics, okay? Because those native plants just basically take over. So, um, natives are, they're just really not always the best choice. So, mm, yeah, try to do a little pushback on that. Okay, enough said for that. That, that was the, the only rant I have in this particular episode. The alternatives to bad soil conditions for me for two of the homes that I've already mentioned is a two-prong approach. The first option is raised beds. And you've seen on a couple of the YouTube uh, episodes recently where we have created raised beds as opposed to trying to put things in the ground everywhere. Now there are some places around Brook and Pond that we were able, like when we transplanted our green giant arborvitae on the hillside, there's enough soil there, because it's not down on the bedrock where the house is, that we were able to condition it up with some good planter mix and reestablish them there. Okay, so exception to the rule. Another place is where we did the hillside planting right below the arborvitae, where we brought in some boulders and we retained up about two feet above the French drain area and backfilled with an imported, much more productive loamy soil. And down on the driveway area where we took the existing boulders that were here and we ring them in kind of a, uh, a lazy half moon shape and backfilled behind them. Planted those up with the same loamy soil. And our initial job in the backyard that was absolutely useless and horribly poorly thought out as far as the previous two owners. We brought in an excavator. We dug down so that we had an open, relatively flat, not relatively flat. It was actually sloped from the house out to where the hillside was going to be. And then we took the, the tailings, the soil, and mounded it up near the utility pole. And you've seen the, you've seen the project, you've seen the pictures. If not, check them out on the YouTube channel. And then we boulder ringed around those to retain it. And the excavation tailings were good enough where if we use some good organic planter mix and stuff, it's very plantable and it's working. All three projects, actually four projects, are doing really, really well. So the raised bed approach to landscaping can be small in scale you know, we've all seen raised bed vegetable gardens, but you can also do raised bed larger landscapes as well. You can do the, the boulder situation, like what I've done and done for many, many years. You can also do uh, small retaining walls. You can do multi-tiered wood construction, raised beds, and bring in uh, imported good soil and grow your landscape in a much more controlled environment and in a much more productive environment by getting up above that crappy native soil that just is a headbanger to try to conquer. It really is. Now, one other example that I have here that's near the dwelling, it's along the garage wall uh, that kind of faces northwest, and that's where the arborvitae came out. Very poorly placed, but that's where the previous owner had planted them. So extracted those out and then enlarged the hole where they were at. They were actually growing there. They, they, weren't, they weren't unhealthy at all. 
and then I enlarged the hole and enriched it with a lot of planter mix and I let it set for about a month because that was early springtime. We were jettisoning out west and coming back and when I came back, we eventually looked at the hole and it was pretty organic looking. It had native soil. It had some rock in there, which I pulled out and we put in a little bit of the, the loamy loams and then planted hydrangea. We have five of the uh, endless summer hydrangea there and they're doing fantastic. They're doing really good. So even though it's an exception to the rule there, we actually are getting good results. And I have been feeding them because like I said, it's a very porous soil. So depending on your situation, one thing to try to avoid is what we call stratification. And stratification happens when we do a boulder retainer or a brick wall retainer or a wood retainer of some kind. And we create raised beds, but we have that native soil sitting underneath our beautifully cultivated, imported, planter mixed with loam soil. And we have this very hard stratification right at the bottom. So if you have a shallow raised bed, say 18 inches or even two feet or less, it's a good idea to get out there with a pick and just break up the surface just a little bit before you dump your new soils in there. It will allow plants, especially trees, to penetrate as much as possible and not grow their roots vertically down and then horizontal without penetrating into the native soil that's there just a little bit. It will give you a stronger root system as far as plant, but especially tree stability and not give you that weakened, uh, strong storm, fast growing tree and soft soil blowover situation. So try to scarify and break up that native soil just a little bit, just a, a couple inches is enough usually, and then go ahead and backfill and do your planting. So boulders are obviously not the only materials you can use for raised bed situation. You can use materials such as wood. Uh, if you do use wood for like a raised vegetable garden, I strongly suggest that uh, if you get a ground rated type of wood, that you encapsulate that and don't grow your vegetables in a chemically treated wood. That pressure treat and stuff, that copper arsenate and other materials that you use, I wouldn't want to be growing my food in places like that. So what you can do is you can uh, put a plastic barrier around it. You can put a drainage, like a foundation drainage type of lining around it, which would really preserve it for a much, much longer period of time. Simple six mil plastic will work, uh, but I like to have airflow in the beds itself. So you may find that uh, retaining wall type of stuff a lot better. Anyway, um, you, you also use logs, you know, you can use uh, treated, not treated logs, but landscape timbers. You can use metal, you can use cement block, you can use poured concrete and forms to create yourself raised beds. So, you know, your imagination is the only limitation. Now, if you do go really raised, say you're on a hillside and you're gonna terrace that thing out and your first terrace is gonna be like five feet tall, maybe six feet tall, definitely address the drainage issue there as far as hydraulic pressure that could build up behind such a wall. You can do that with stacked block. You generally don't have to do it as much with boulder retainers because there's so many cracks and crevices that water won't really build up necessarily behind them. But you can do it if you want to, but uh, generally it's more for cement, it's more for stacked block, uh, certainly a poured uh, retaining wall foundation, then you're gonna want drainage behind it. The small hillside planting that I did here in the back, I did not have. It was only 24 inches high, and there were so many gaps at the base of it. Any water that would be coming from thaw and snow melt next spring, it's just gonna go right through the, right through the base of the boulders anyway.
So in your raised bed, your backfilling behind these new raised beds can be a quality soil from a professional supplier or good soil from neighbors, family, and friends that are looking to uh, offload some clean fill. Maybe they have a project where they're pouring a new shed pad or something and they've had to excavate out some good clean dirt. You don't want to bring the same crap, some other's crap, to your place and uh, call it good clean fill. That's not going to get you anywhere. And you also have to remember the time of year. If you get good clean fill, make sure that it's not weed infested and weed seed infested. You'll always get a little something. It's very, very hard unless it's actually steam sterilized type of soil, which in a bulk soil material, that doesn't happen very often at all. So our second option to crap soil, and you could use it in conjunction with raised beds. Uh, what we have done here at Brook and Pond is we opted for another style of landscaping, and that's container landscaping. Uh, we went out and found a great deal at one of the discount stores here locally and found some big 20-gallon plastic pots and some smaller five gallon square pots that uh, are black in color, black plastic. They're decorative. I mean, they're not the highest quality of quality, but they are certainly gonna work for our application. And on the north side of the house and also the east side of the house, where there isn't much good stuff left, rather than banging my head against a wall, literally, and putting in expensive plants, only hoping to get minimal response out of them, we decided to change it up a little bit and started to go container. And we went out and we got some great ivory halo dogwoods, some uh, dark summer wine, nine bark. We got uh, quick fire hydrangea, some velvet moon hosta, some dark side of the moon spirea. And they're all planted up in a in these containers and they're they look good i mean where in the ground i don't think they would have looked as nice but elevated up into pots and fronting the dark charcoal gray sides of our house they really pop and they they contrast well and they go well with the grays and the blacks and the whites in our color motif and so container material you can use, uh, my, you could build your own if you have uh, the wherewithal. I've seen people weld metal, sheet metal together and make nice, beautiful painted containers. They're always the ceramic ones. Uh, there's always terracotta containers uh, of various sizes. There's wooden containers. There's half wine barrels. Uh, you can even go out and I can remember buying 36 inch box specimen containers, the ones that uh, growers actually plant trees into and upsize trees into. I got those and after I used them at a garden show, I put them out in the vegetable garden and I used them for three years as a vegetable garden planting bed. It took a lot of soil to fill them up, but I was able to grow, shoot, I was growing watermelon, I grew carrots, I grew broccoli, I grew all kinds of stuff in those things. So just another idea if you can source that kind of stuff. So with the containers we got, let, let's compare cost a little bit and let's compare success and what, what it means. Sometimes you have to pay for your success. So we, we averaged about, I think it was $175 for all the containers and we still have a couple left over. And then the most, well, not the most expensive, but close, was the potting mix for all of these containers. I bought 17 two cubic foot bags of potting mix, and then we went and got the plants. We spent about $400 on plants. Up here in Northern Maine, man, there's, <laughs> there is a selection. There's box store selections, and then there's a small mom and pop nursery. And the mom and pop nursery had just got it going on. I mean, they, they know quality plant material, and they know how to take care of it. The box stores, if you get there when the stuff arrives within the first 48 hours, you'll get some quality plant material. It's not as big as what I find at the mom and pop nursery. And certainly the service is not. So 
we spent the extra dollars and got the plant material at the mom and pop nursery and they turned out great if you check out the youtube channel this week you will see some of these plant material and one of them is going to be our plant of the week and so now although i have a raised bed right across the gravel patio from where these containers are they both work together number one because of color combination and number two the east side the east side here gets uh well it gets sunshine this time of year we're at the end of july 2024 so we're looking at about six hours of sun in the morning and then shade the rest of the afternoon and the hostas out there are a lot happier than the ones i put on the 10 to 12 hour sunny hillside that uh, got a little shocked but they'll be fine next year because they'll be used to it but for right now the velvet moon hostas the hydrangea i think i got to, what was the name of that hydrangea i think it was quick fire it's a panicle and uh, it has a, a white flower that comes out and then it turns kind of a red before they drop so gonna look kind of slick and it's very foliagey looking it fills up uh, the corners of the house we're actually going to add two more because i thought three would do it three groupings and nah i think five is going to work better so oh darn gotta go back to the nursery again so the container option is i guess it's a it's another way of looking at raised bed but it's also a little creativity that goes along with it you can get color introduced through your containers you can get uh various texture as far as ceramic versus terracotta versus wood uh, i don't suggest mixing all those i think one particular one looks best and you kind of stick with it so you have a little bit of continuity but you can you can spray paint you can paint paint wood you can do all kinds of things and make the the color motif work well with the plant material that you're using for instance the ivory halo dogwood they look really good right now with their green and white and red twig foliage in a large black pot it, it looks really good it, it i don't know if you were classy but it is it's kind of a classy look to it in my humble opinion so containers uh, i don't suggest if you have a huge yard that you go containers you can and you can make big containers work for you but uh, usually a smaller scale landscape really lends itself to container material so keep that in mind i mean if you have a half acre lot and you're gonna go i got crap soil coach so i'm gonna do containers try the raised bed approach first and then as you come in towards your dwelling and your true outdoor living area then you can convert to larger containers than smaller containers and do it that way it might it might work out a lot better especially for the checkbook so uh, the plus side plus side of raised beds you're going to have uh, a much more conditioned soil medium to grow things successfully in in containers you're going to have a commercially produced probably sterile type of potting mix that you can grow success in as well so what could possibly be the downside the downside sometimes is that you are in control of everything you're in control of the water you're in control of the food because mother nature isn't going to provide that for you from its native base its native soil situation there's a lot of nutrients in hard crappy rocky clay caliche type of soil there's a lot of nutrients but it's so impacted that it makes it really hard for roots to extract those nutrients out and have water not sit around the feeder roots rather than to perk through and move on after the plant has used it so drainage becomes quite an issue but in this case you're going to have great drainage great drainage in pots great drainage in raised beds you are going to plant successfully and the only downside is you have to pay attention to it container gardens are 100 percent uh, human managed you can have rainfall be uh, part of your watering if it's out 
out in the open where the rainfall is actually going to hit it. It's not under eaves or on a covered patio or something. But you have to check it. You have to manage the moisture levels in containers much more closely than you would if it was in the ground. Same with raised beds. Depending on what style of raised bed you actually do, you're going to have to check periodically. And can you irrigate these things? Absolutely. Uh, drip irrigation with micro sprays and drip emitters, that kind of an automated system can really knock down the water management and water maintenance really, really quickly. You just have to know how to put them in. So if you have container gardens and you're a hose dragger like me, then you have to go out there, especially during the warmer months. Uh, there has been times where I have checked water in my raised boulder retained twice a day because it was June, July, and now almost August. I've gone out in the new plantings and checked them twice a day to make sure the moisture levels were good. And so far, so good. The potting mix that I am using for the containers uh, have worked out really well. I think it has a little bit more of a peat base because it seems to not dry out. It crusts up a little bit on the surface, dry out, but if I scratch down just a couple inches, it's wet. And so I can imagine how wet it would be at the bottom of these large containers. And so I kind of I kind of hold off on watering uh, for yeah, a day. And I noticed one of the ivory halo dogwoods out here yesterday afternoon. It had a little bit of uh, direct sun and reflective heat off the wall and she started to wilt a little bit. So I, I gave it a good drink and perked right back up without any problem. So manage your water correctly. Nothing wants to sit in soaking, sopping wet dirt except water plants. Normal plant material wants to be evenly moist, uh, but never saturated. And make sure if you go containers that you make sure that they have an adequate drain holes in them. These that I did, I took a step bit and drilled four large holes in the bottom. Even some of them have five large holes because I don't want this potting mix that tends to stay a little wet not to be able to drain out. That's going to be really crucial as these plants mature in those things that they have a, a good drainage, good drainage system for the water to escape. So when you're looking at crappy soil, whether it be rocky, like shaley, uh, clay type soil, what I have to fight here, or maybe Georgia red clay or southwest caliche sandstone, whatever it might be, you might want to uh, invest and look into creating your own raised bed type of landscape and raised bed gardens. Uh, certainly, certainly makes it uh, fun to have success where success would probably avoid you at all costs with the native soil. Care and maintenance. Care and maintenance on these things are generally drastically reduced because of weeds that aren't there natively. Uh, I would suggest putting down some type of a weed fabric. If you do large raised beds, put a weed fabric down and then backfill. So if you have any rhizomic or root generated type of weeds, they don't come up into that. And then as, and I've done this the past three weeks now, as maybe little weeds start to pop up in the soil that you've purchased, which can happen, it is happening to me, you just get out there as part of your inspection weekly or daily and just pull them, just pull them out and it, it'll take care of itself. Uh, the mulches, the mulches retarding quite a bit of the weed seed that's coming up, but those that have made it through, I pull out very simply and I'll keep up on the mulch layer, you know, and it'll, it'll eventually burn itself out and I'll be fine. If something does blow in and it germinates, just pay attention to it. Take it out. Now, as far as feeding, as far as fertilizing, containers are more important than raised beds. Both will respond very well to either organic dry type of fertilizer, uh, depending on the type of plant material that you've used, also liquid fertilizer. I'm a big proponent of half strength miracle Grow or Mir Acid for getting things started 
and then I'll switch over to a oh Espoma or EB Stone organic fertilizer, even Dr. Jack's type or Captain Jack's type of fertilizers as the plants start to mature. Go out there in the spring and then after bloom season or early fall, I'll give it another feeding and that'll generally get it through season to season. You can also in containers use uh, slow release. I've used Osmocote for geez, 40 years as a slow release fertilizer in container plantings and does a really good job. It doesn't burn, it releases over the course of like six months and you can mix it up in the planter mix. If it doesn't come with it already, uh, you can mix it up in the planter or the potting mix and feed your plants that way. So how'd I do? Is this something that you suffer from and that you might need to correct? Here's a couple of options. So don't be afraid to think outside the box. But if you do suffer from crappy soil that is not going to allow you to grow anything except weeds, you might want to think about doing, doing it this way. Anyway, hey, don't forget to check out the video this week. We will go a little more in depth, at least visually. And don't forget to check out the website, youryardcoach.com. If you need a little lesson on how to do some landscaping, uh, boy, the book and the course are there and also the checklist that I offer. And then also designing consultation. I have a consultation today with a gentleman in Wisconsin I'm looking forward to. So until next week, guys, I appreciate your time as always to your landscape success. And I'll say goodbye for now.